morning. <clears throat> this is Happy Father's Day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is June 18th of 2023. My name is Douglas Griffin. Uh, this is my Sunday school class. In case you've never, you're tuning in for the first time, I'm going through the book of Exodus. I started in Genesis. I'm kind of going through the whole Bible. So if you stick with me for the next 20 years, we will have made it all the way through. I, uh, on Wednesdays, I'm teaching in the New Testament, going through the New Testament. Uh, and on certain Sundays, I'm starting like in the middle of the Old Testament. I mean, so I'm in 1 Samuel when I preach in Exodus now. I'm in the book of John, the New Testament. And um, discovered that it's easier to understand the Bible to be able to comprehend what's taught there if you go verse by verse by verse by verse it's not such a mystery uh, my sister's saying hi hi sister okay so going back to Exodus nope that's not Exodus and that's not Exodus and that's not Exodus okay none of these are Exodus I have to just look on my desktop then uh, but I can't even get to my desktop because I have so many other things open. Close that. Close that. Where is Exodus? There it is. Exodus, we're in Exodus chapter 30. There we go. Move that over there. Um, so in Exodus chapter 30, no, I don't want that one. I did that one last week. Bless my heart. This is part two of Exodus chapter 30. And what's going on is that um, God is giving his law. Moses has gone up on Mount Sinai. He's getting all these instructions from God, especially in how to build the tabernacle, because this tabernacle is going to be the main way that um, he's able to communicate his precepts to the children of Israel. Come on. Okay, I know how to do it. I go here. And then I go here. Bless my heart. Open recent. I want Exodus part two. Okay. So, um, here's the deal. There's no church that people can go to each week to learn about God. There's no Bible at this point. Moses hasn't started writing it yet. The only way God can... Is God is teaching at this time is by explaining the tabernacle. He's going to use that as a living lesson about his power, about his forgiveness, about his anointing, um, etc. Et so he's not just explaining, here's how I want you to build it. Each part has a lesson. This is, this is the tabernacle. The tabernacle becomes their Bible. It's the place where God is going to meet with them. And so how to approach God is, is very important. Now, in the second half of Exodus chapter 30, he gets to, we get to the last piece of equipment that is to go in the temple, um, in the tabernacle. I'm sorry, so it became a temple 200 years later. But at this point, just the tabernacle. Uh, a tent where they're meeting. Um, so in Exodus chapter 30, verse 17, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze, with its base also of bronze for washing. So it's like a bird bath. It's like a fountain, right? Um, but not a fountain on the ground, but, you know, on a pedestal. And there's a big, huge basin and uh, it was important that they washed with it. In Exodus chapter 38, he's going to tell us that, uh, it says he made a laver of bronze. In Exodus chapter 38, verse 8, it said he made a laver of bronze and its base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women. So it's shiny enough for when you look in, you see your face, right? As long as the water's clean. Uh, from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Um, so you shall put it, back to Exodus chapter 30, verse 18, you shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. So remember that there's three parts. 
to the tabernacle. There's the outer court where the altar was and where sacrifices were done. Then there's the actual, and, and all of it's surrounded by curtains, but there's no top on the outer court. Then on the inside where there is a top, that's divided into two more sections, which is the, where the priests go, and we have the lampstand and the showbread, then the table of incense, um, and then the, the other section is where God's throne sits. Um, and so he says, before you go into the tent, when you're still in the altar section, in between the altar and the door of the tent, which is really just a curtain, that's where you put the, the washing because after people have asked for forgiveness, look at yourself. Well, that's not true because I'm making that because they had to wash before they did that too. But then you had to wash a second time, right? So you've asked for forgiveness and then uh, you, you wash again and you see yourself because it's about you. Our forgiveness is about us. We think it's about other people. You need to ask forgiveness because you're a sinner. But God wants us to see ourselves. Look into the wash and see yourself, right? So um, he'd wash his hands. He says, uh, you shall put it between the tabernacle meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. The Verse 19, for Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and feet in water from it. So what's this teaching them? Um, in Hebrews chapter 10, oh, well, let's back up. Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and feet. So they're just wearing sandals. They're not wearing Nikes, tennis shoes. And everywhere they walk, they're getting dust on their feet constantly. They're, they're in, you kind of know how the people dress in the desert in those days, kind of long robes, right? Uh, so your hands would get dirty and your feet. The rest of you has been kind of covered up. So he says, before you go into my temple, I need you to respect it and understand what purity is and understand uh, that you need to wash away all the filth from the world before you come in my presence. We do that. Lord, uh, we approach you humbly and we're, we're washing away the filth from the world. And we ask for a gift. Jesus says, this is how you approach the Father God. Uh, you say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's the first thing you're asking for. You're, you're holy. You want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we want and forgive us our trespasses. This is part of the prayer. Um, that forgiveness part. We approach him saying, we thank you that you forgive us our trespasses. That, that's what you do. And so the forgiveness and the washing away of the filth of the world as we enter God's presence, he wanted there to be a separation. There has to be a separation. Um, on purpose, that we see God as different than ourselves, but approachable. I've, I've spoken on this a few times. I've seen households where the parents and the child, there was no separation. The parents were kind of just as childish as the child. And so the children don't respect the parent. And the parents say, uh, you can't leave the house tonight. And the child says, who are you talking to? And then they go on out. And the parents like, oh, they won't listen to me. Because there's no separation. Right? I've seen other households where that would never fly. <laughs> where the parents say, you ain't going nowhere. And if the child starts to look like they're about to say something, smack, okay, I'm not going nowhere. And, and they, they know you're the parent, I'm the child, and when I say something, it works. So God needs for us to see there's a separation between him and us, that we can approach him, but that his ways are higher than our ways. What he tells us to do, he knows more than what we know. We've got to trust that. God's smarter than us. God's bigger than us. So, Lord, you say don't do that. I'm going to trust you. So we think that he's smarter than us. We have to think that he'll bring consequences, that there are consequences if we don't listen. Because when you don't think there are consequences, you just do whatever you want. And psh, what you going to do? You ain't going to do nothing. Right? So, uh, but he also wants us to see that, that, that he's holy and that that's the goal. Not necessarily for us to be holy, but that sin uh, hurts us. And so 
he's asking us not to sin and to ask forgiveness for our sin so that we can stop the death that comes our way every time we sin. Uh, there are things that are slowly killing us that God says, don't do those things, right? And so unless we see the separ separation, unless we honor that, then we put ourselves in jeopardy. Because if you tell your child, uh, you got to look both ways before you cross the street, and the child's like, Psst, I don't have to listen to you. The child's going to go out and get hit by a car. I don't know why they didn't listen to me. Because you didn't have a separation. You made the child think, you're equal. And then, so why would I listen to you if we're equal? So he's going to say things in here like, if you don't do this, you're going to die. Because he, he's scaring them into believing, I've got all the answers for you. You've got to believe I've got the answers. For 200 years, you were in Egypt serving gods that weren't really gods. So if you defied them or did whatever, there was no consequence because they're not actually God. But I'm trying to teach you that I am God. I do know more than you and that there are consequences. So uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness into the holiest of by the blood of Jesus. Why can we just walk in? The blood of Jesus. They, they had the blood of bulls and cows and sheep, etc., and goats that they were using. And once they did the sacrifice, then the priest was able to walk in. Well, we can all walk in now because we're all priests before God. We don't have to, you don't have to wait for a preacher or someone to let you into heaven. We can all walk into heaven. So he says in, in Hebrews 10, 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil. So the, only the priests could go in, and in that second veil, only the hot priest can go in once a year. But he says he's consecrated this way for us that we can all go through the, the veil. And then it says that is his flesh. So, uh, you know, that's going to be a long concept to explain. Uh, but because of what he did in his flesh, we're able to go through the veil. That's good enough. Okay. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So this labor that was outside this uh, basin, like a big huge sink, this basin that was outside, they would have to wash and uh, sprinkle water on themselves, as I said, before they went in. So he's saying that's still a principle that God was teaching, that we are able to approach him in full assurance of faith because now our hearts have been sprinkled with water. Uh, our evil conscience has been walked away. Our wicked conscience think that we're always thinking of sin and, oh, no, I'm, I can't approach God and because I'm a sinner. <sighs> nope, we can't approach God. He's washing all that away. When God forgives, all that sin is gone. We don't have to. Uh, I was in a conversation with somebody yesterday. He kept talking about, yes, but in the past I did this and in the past I did this. like God doesn't remember that. And he chooses not to remember that. So we think, oh, God doesn't love me because I'm a... God's like, nope. That's what the washing symbolizes. You can now enter the presence. So our hearts have been sprinkled. Our evil conscience, our wicked conscience that's conscious of sin has been washed. It says our bodies are washed with pure water. Verse 20, when they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar of the minister to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. So he's reminding him, see, remember that scripture, which we hadn't got to the lest they die part. But when the priests had to wash uh, before they went to the altar, when the priests had to wash before they went into the tent, to, uh, they had to wash. That was just symbolic of the forgiveness. He's teaching them forgiveness. Because again, they don't have a Bible. So he's giving them a physical example. See, they're clean now. They can approach God so that they can learn, oh, that's my way in. I just need to ask for forgiveness and his blood washes me, I'm washed, so now I can talk to God, I can approach God anytime I want, because I'm approaching him through this means. Uh, Exodus chapter 30, verse 21, 
so they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die. So there's a lest they die part. Why the threat? Because, um, again, you'll, you'll, you warn your child, don't play with fire. Don't set those curtains on fire uh, because you, you could kill yourself. You have to put that fear, because just saying don't do something, uh, for some reason that's just not a deterrent to people. Don't do that, and you think, oh, I can't wait to do it. Uh, <laughs> God told Adam and Eve, don't eat at that tree lest you die. Mm. And immediately they'll go, eh, are you really going to die? I don't think you're going to die. And, and, and so that's the, uh, that, that fire is so pretty. If you set the curtain on fire, how, how are you going to die just because you set the curtain on fire? Now the curtains, but you're different. You're not the curtain. So go ahead, light it. See how pretty it's going to be. And so we have to have that fear in us uh, to prevent us from doing a thing that's going to harm us. So he's like, if you do that, I will kill you. <laughs> so don't do it. Don't do it. He, he, he put a lest you die in there a few places. Like, if you don't respect, if you think you can just walk into my tabernacle anyway, just mud all over your feet and your hands are dirty, then you're disrespecting me and my holiness and not understanding the separation. Then I won't be able to help you. Again, like that parent who can no longer help that child because the child now thinks, well, I'm equal to you. For some kids, that happens when they're 20, some when they're 30, some when 50, they're still listening to you. The parent says, don't do it. They still go, okay, mama. Okay, daddy. But there's some five-year-olds who think, I don't have to listen to you. And so you can't help them. You can't say, don't do that and don't do this and say, because they don't, they don't feel they have to listen to you. They're equal to you, right? There's no fear. And, and so that child's going to suffer many things because there's so much about the world they don't know that can harm them that the parents do know. And yet I can't tell, you know, you, you think we're equal. So God has to say, no, there's not an equalness. Before you walk in my temple, you must wash your hands, you must wash your feet. There's a preparation because I am separate from you. You have to see me as holy. Otherwise, when I say don't do this and don't do that or go now or stop or you won't, you'll think we're the same and you'll just hear a clicking sound in your head instead of my actual words. So it says they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die and it shall be a statute forever to them to him and his descendants throughout their generations. Um, so uh, this, this lest you die thing, uh, God put that in a bunch of places as a warning. But, and, and then when, you, when the little child's about to run out in the street for their volleyball and they're not seeing that truck coming, you snatch their hand and scare them and ah, you were about to get killed by that truck and they don't know. That could, you've got to warn them because people die every day, unfortunately, because they didn't heed certain warnings, playing with guns or whatever, you know, just whatever, not realizing. Uh, so you're, you're, you're saving that child's life when you say you could, you could get killed if you do that. Don't, don't uh, go to the top of that building and jump off to see how it feels. You could, get, you could kill yourself. So God put a bunch of those lest you dies in here. In Exodus chapter 28, we just read a couple. Uh, in verse 34, when he's talking about the priest going into the minister, he says a golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate. So at the bottom of his robe, he had to tie a pomegranate and a bell, a pomegranate and a bell, so that they could hear him as he went. But the point was, wear a robe when you go in there. Don't think you can just approach, you have to put on my holiness. Um, so a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe all around, and it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers. And its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out, that he may not die. So I will strike him dead. And he, that's why it's so shocking that Nadab and Abihu said, oh, we can do whatever we want. Can you? Let me show you. So uh, again, God has to put this fear in them because there's so much ahead that they don't know about. For generations to come, dangers are going to be running into that they have to fear God and say, we better listen to God. We better consult God because he knows and we don't. So um, in Exodus chapter 28, verse 42, another, they put in another, lest you die. 
He says, you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. This is when God invented underwear. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs, and they shall be an Aaron and his sons when they come into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, that they do not incur iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants after him. So he have to keep, because psst, they could get lazy one day and just, I'm going to just run up there naked and, and minister before these people. God, no, you won't. I will kill you. And then he had to do it a couple times just to show them. Uh, I don't know. You, you can't be in that much of a hurry. You can go ahead and put on some clothes. Exodus chapter 30, verse 22. It says, Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also take for yourself quality spices. So he's about to describe, so he's described the, the, the laver outside, again, the big washing bowl. Now he's going to be specific about what type of spices go in the incense. Um, and why? What's that lesson? Well, well, we'll figure it out. So also take for yourself quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh. So there, he's, and he's making a special formula that they're not allowed to repeat anywhere else. They can use myrrh other places, but they can't use it in this fashion, in these proportions. I'm going to make a special formula for you. So he says you, uh, he starts with myrrh. Myrrh is this it's kind of common spice uh, that they began to use to make uh, dead corpses antiseptic, okay? In John chapter 19, verse 39, when Jesus was on the cross and he had passed, in verse 39 it says, And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 100 pounds. And then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices and the custom of the Jews is to, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. So they would... They began to use this in the later days, this myrrh. So again, they're not per forbidden from using myrrh. They're just forbidden to use it in the way that God's about to describe. But that's what it became its use. First, we've heard of myrrh. And so it's interesting that um, the wise men brought myrrh. So when we, when I teach, I think on, in Luke, after John, I'm going to go to Luke, we'll, we'll, we get to those scriptures and we'll discuss why the, what, what the frankincense meant, what the myrrh meant, what it all meant. Uh, anyway, so you can take some myrrh, and then Exodus chapter 30, verse 22, and half as much sweet-smelling cinnamon. So you put some myrrh and put some sweet-smelling cinnamon. And this was how they made perfume. Uh, in Proverbs 7, 17, it says, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, alloys, and cinnamon. So the, the myrrh helped the, the cinnamon smell come out, and um, there's a specific reason, but I want to go on. Uh, second part of verse 22 of Exodus chapter 30 says, 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane, so uh, which was sugar and cinnamon. And, and so God's creating a fragrance here on purpose. That he's, he's, here's my formula. Don't repeat this anywhere else. 500 shekels of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen, a little bit of olive oil. And you shall make from these a holy anointing oil, an ointment compounded according to the art of the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. So it wasn't just you take some Western oil like we do today. Go just throwing in some Western oil and pour it on people, and that's anointing. <clears throat> this smelled fantastic. It was like anointing somebody with perfume. Um, because he wanted there to be a difference. So you can smell when somebody was anointed. He wanted because the oil was invisible. So you couldn't you could see it for a minute, but he wants you to smell it. So you so he's giving them a sensory experience because he wanted them to know when this oil is being poured on the priest. Um, and not only the priest, but the king, the prophet, priest, and king in the Old Testament were the ones who were anointed. In, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 1, verse 39, it says, Then Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tabernacle, right? The oil that was made especially for the tabernacle, and he anointed Solomon. And they blew the horn, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. So the prophet, the priest, the king, they're anointed with this oil. Um, why? Uh, because there's a, is this where I talk about? Okay. Um, he's, he's teaching them the difference between when you're just a regular Joe walking around, regular Bill, regular Sally walking around, and when you've been anointed. So he wants them to know there's a difference in power. There's an upgrade in power. There's things you can do with your own strength 
and things that you can do when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So he wants them to know the difference, know that there's a difference. So before they go out to battle, uh, they pray, ask for God's anointing. Be, or when the Holy Spirit comes, does come upon them, they know that's to do something, that's some sort of service. He's trying to get them used to this idea that a person can be anointed. Uh, in Exodus chapter 30, verse 26, it says, with it you shall anoint the tabernacle of meeting and the ark of the testimony. So uh, I'm consecrating the tabernacle. So my spirit is there. I want you to anoint the, the ark of testimony where, where, the, where the mercy seat is so that you know my, my spirit is there. The table, all its utensils, the lampstand, its utensils, and the altar of incense. All these things I want you to anoint. The altar of burnt offering with all its utensils and the labor and its base. You should consecrate them that they may be most holy. So I want you to believe that the Spirit of God is on all those things, that he's separated them for his service. So God wants to say there are certain things that are just for my service. Don't use it for other things. Don't, because then you make it too ordinary. You start to take it for granted. You have to believe that there are certain things that are just you consecrated for God's service. Because if we, now it's not that you can't, have, like you can wear tennis shoes in front of God. No, I had the special shoes when I talked to God. He didn't say that. There's specific things that we have to see as separate. Um, uh, and, and so and he tells you what they are, but he's not saying all things on earth must be anointed for my service, just specific things so that you understand their use is for me. You shall consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. So that's why you got to wash your hands. You got to be anointed before you touch them. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister to me as priests. So um, he wants you to act differently in the temple than you do in the saloon. Uh, this is anointed. So, because he, oh, now eventually he rips the curtain. And he comes out, and then we understand that wherever God's presence is, is holy. So if we, if we get a, so he starts off trying to train them, there's a different way you act in the presence of God. But eventually, he's going to say, and now wherever I am, there's a different way you need to act. And I'm everywhere. And this way I can protect you in the saloon. My presence is there too, so I want you to act differently. Uh, when you go to the, this place or that, you know, the, just know that my presence is with you so that you can act differently and I can preserve you because it's one thing to preserve you when you're in the temple, but I want to preserve you wherever you go in life. So if we can be conscious of that, then we'll, we'll be different, we'll be listening to his voice and we'll avoid a lot of trouble. But now he's saying I want you to anoint Aaron and his sons. And so for service so that they're anointed to go into my presence but he's teaching them uh, about the spirit coming upon us the spirit is within us and sometimes comes upon us and there's a difference between the spirit within you and the spirit coming up on you we always have that jesus said um i shall be in you a well of water springing up to everlasting life, like a, that you can always draw on. Like that well, where they would dig those wells and there was always water there they can go, go to every day and draw that water out. That's the spirit in you. But he says, when he talks about the Holy Spirit coming upon you, he says, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water, and that's for other people. So the spirit comes upon you because God is asking you to do something for other people. He's within you so you can have your own relationship to him. And he's beginning to teach that to them when, when Aaron and um, his sons are anointed for service. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, it says, uh, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Talking about David. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And so there were times in David's life where the Spirit of God would come upon him and he's able to defeat Goliath. And the Spirit would come upon him. He's able to do all these certain things. The Spirit was not upon him all the time. But when it came upon him, then he knew he can go out and he had victory because God was calling him to do something for the people. Um, in Judges chapter 14, it says, So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. 
And now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. It's like, uh-oh, what's there a lion doing here in, in this great vineyard? And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. So if the Spirit comes upon you, that you know that he's calling you to do something for someone. Uh, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. So he's protecting his mother and father. Though he had nothing in his hand, but did not tell his father's mother what he had done. I didn't, I, he didn't say, he just protected them before they even knew he was able to take care of that lion. Um, so the spirit came upon him in order to protect. In Judges chapter 3, verse 9. It says, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, who is Caleb's younger brother. So Kenaz is Caleb's younger, younger brother. And so this is Caleb's nephew. It says, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. To do what? It says, and he judged Israel. So the spirit of the Lord came upon him to give him wisdom. Whenever people came to him and asked, what shall I do? The spirit of the Lord would come upon him and he'd be able to give them the right advice. So he went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan, Rishathiam, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan, Rishathiam. Okay, whatever those names are. So anyway, um, so also when he went out to battle, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Ezekiel chapter 11 says, Therefore prophesy against them, prophesy, O son of man. Then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said to me, Speak, thus says the Lord. Thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. And he began to prophesy. So the Spirit came of the Lord came upon him and gave him wisdom to give to uh, Israel concerning their future. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, it says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out of the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. And Ezekiel had this vision again, about what was going to happen to the future of Israel and, and judgment that was coming upon them, but also restoration that was coming upon them. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon him to show him something. Uh, in Luke chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus is in the temple, and he's just beginning his ministry. He says, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So this is Isaiah prophesying about the Messiah because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. So when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, he knew he has to go out and do something. I'm going to preach. I'm going to heal. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set, at liberty, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Right? So he's, he's starting this. God is starting this back when the temple is first, when the tabernacle is first constructed. I want you to put this anointing on them, and I want everyone for a mile around to be able to smell this oil that is now upon them and know, oh, that's the Spirit of God anointing them so they can go into the temple. And again, like I said, no Bible. We're able to go to 15 different verses. They had no Bible to go to. So God is showing them literally in, in a way, see this oil that's upon them, that's, that's like me coming upon you for service. Okay, Exodus chapter 30, verse 31. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on man's flesh. Well, I thought you just said poured on air and the sun. He means, he means on common man's flesh. This can be poured on the priests because they're anointed. But you don't get to go home and make some and dab at some of the pine your ears before you go out to the club. It's not for you. This anointing oil is for service. This, this, I'm trying to create a separation here that when they're going into the temple, that's when this oil is used. No one else can use it. Nor shall you make any other like it, it says, according to the composition. You can use these other materials in other ways, but you can't use it in this way. You can't do 500 of this and 200 of that and 300 of this one. I've come up with this formula. Do not use it. You'll be sorry. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or if it puts any of it, of it on an outsider, shall be cut off from his people, which means killed. Mm -hmm. So do not do this. Use it just for this purpose. So uh, you can take communion at church, but I want to catch you in the backyard with your girlfriends uh, having communion and turning it into a bar. No, I'm just making up a whole story. This is a purpose. It's used for this purpose and not for anything else. 
So don't sneak into the to the communion wine deacons at night and start drinking and you know watching uh, Lucy. So this is all that it's used for. Period. Exodus chapter thirty, verse thirty-four. And the Lord said to Moses, "Now take sweet spices, stachte and orecha and galbanum and pure frankincense. With these sweet spices, there shall be equal amounts of each." And you shall make of these an incense. So we talked about the oil. Now we're talking about the incense. The anointing oil has to spell sweet. So I want everybody to know, ooh, he's being anointed. I can smell it. Now when the prayers are going up, because the incense stands for the prayers, I want everybody to know. I want all the Israel to gather around the tabernacle because he's praying for everybody. And I want you all to be in agreement and pray together. And I want you to smell this incense. It says, you shall make, verse 31, you, you shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting. So you're going to, here's where you're putting it. You're putting it right in front of the throne of God. When, he, when he's talking about the testimony, he's talking about the, um, the Ten Commandments are inside that, um, the mercy seat. So you want to put the incense right in front of it right on the other side of the veil. Um, and you shall put, uh, beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. What does this represent? Paul tells when he's writing to the Corinthians, he's, uh, again, we know that it represents the prayers going up, but it represents more than that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us, he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Meaning he manifests the knowledge, the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. He uses us. We become that fragrance. So through us, he manifests the fragrance of his knowledge. Every, wherever he sends us, wherever we go, we bring the presence of God. It's like bringing that fragrance. like. Ooh, I can smell God is here. How do you know? Because those people here, those Christians are here, and I can smell it. Hopefully that's a good thing. Uh, for we are to God, verse 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So we bring like the fragrance of Christ. We, 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 so that's what this incense not only represented the prayers, but practically for us, it's like we, we're bringing the presence of God to people. We're bringing light to them. He says, among those who are saved and among those who are perishing. God knows which. We don't know which. So we're just to spread his light everywhere. To the one, we are aroma of death, verse 16, leading to death. Unfortunately, uh, to some people, we're saying, you're going to, you know, there is, a, there is a God and you have to believe in him. And, and, and to some, they're, they're going to reject it. So... We're that, we're that aroma of death leading to death because we're just reminding them of what they're going to experience because of their rejection. It says, and to other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Only Christ. So he leads us. We, we're to go out and spread that aroma. We're to go out and spread that fragrance. Uh, and, and that's just symbolic of his presence. So in Exodus chapter 30, just reading the last two verses of, of Exodus chapter 30, but as, verse 37 and 38, for as for the incense you shall make, you shall not make any of it for yourselves, according to his composition. So even the incense, remember, so the anointing oil, don't just make your own little batch, and the incense, don't make any for yourselves, according to this composition. It shall be to you holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any like it, to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. If you just, ooh, I want to make some at home, and I just like to smell it. Nope. See it as holy. See it as holy. See, there's a separation. See, there's a difference between you and me, and understand when it is time to do something for God's service and when you're just doing your thing. There's a difference. So, uh, so know when, yeah, I'm just living my life today and I'm just doing my thing and then know when the Spirit of God's upon me. Ah, I think I'm supposed to do something. I'm suddenly feeling like I should call this person or I should talk to that person or I just feel like I should pick something for my neighbor. Understand, start to learn the difference. When it's just you, you know, you can sit down and, and 
you know, write in your diary and, and know when it's the Spirit of the Lord upon you. Oh, I think I need to write this down. He's trying to teach them a, a difference. He says, if you keep it separate, you'll know the difference. Because a lot of people are wanting to know, well, how do I know God's speaking to me? And when do I know? Keep these things separate and you will know. Have a prayer time. Have a time where maybe you're reading the scriptures. Have a time where you're talking to God. Make that holy. And then as you get to know him in that way, you'll be walking down the street and suddenly, whew, I'm getting that feeling that I used to get, that I would get when I was in my prayer time. I'm getting that feeling that I would get when I was reading the Bible. I can get, that must be God on, on me. There must be something he wants me to do, someone, something he wants me to say, something that he's giving me the power to, you know, accomplish. And so God is saying, if you keep these separate, then you'll know the difference. If you blend it all together, you'll never know when I'm speaking to you when I'm not. So have things that are holy, have things that are conse consecrated just to the Lord so that uh, you can, that's so interesting. Oh, there we are. It's back. So that uh, you can tell when his spirit's upon you. Okay, so that's all of chapter 30. Next week we're in chapter 31. I'm excited. I'm excited mostly because chapter 32 is when they make their uh, idol to Baal and decide to go back to Egypt. And I've been, you know, so God, again, God knows what's about to happen. And so he's preparing them for the thing that's coming up. So we'll read chapter 31 next week where God puts the final touches on his temple. Uh, and then we'll see it all put into play uh, in chapter 32 when they, when they act up. Hey, Richard. Okay, the two cherubim that are on either side are just symbolic of the angels that are around his throne in heaven. They don't necessarily represent two specific angels. There's only a couple angels that we know their names, Gabriel and Michael, but Gabriel and Michael often left the presence of God. So these two angels wouldn't represent them because the angels that are around the throne in heaven, Richard, never leave the presence of God. Gabriel and Michael left all the time. So they just represent, so if anyone says, uh, they're inaccurate um, because the Bible says these are the angels that are always around his throne. So uh, they don't represent anybody specifically. They just represent the angels. God didn't like told, tell them to make a whole replica of heaven, just the throne and know that the angels were there. Okay, so thanks so much for that question, though. Uh, and uh, thank you for tuning in today. I will see some of you next week. And others, I'll see you on Wednesday as we are in the book of John and Jesus is about to go to the cross. All right, thanks a lot. All right, bye-bye.